I, I decided to do a part three because there were so many questions at the end of the, the two videos that we did. If you, by the way, if, you, if you're watching this and you haven't seen the other two videos, I'll put a description below. I would suggest you go back and watch them. It's a fascinating um, series of events. <clears throat> it's not gonna make an awful lot of sense if you haven't watched the other two videos. So go back and watch those two videos. It's day 80 of the lockdown in Peru, so I'm, uh, I'm sporting a uh, lockdown beard. I'm gonna read out who asked the questions, but to be honest, most of the questions I've got here were, were asked many times. Okay, let's, let's get cracking anyway. From Pal98111, he said, he said the ship was a lemon that needed work constantly, even under warranty. No wonder the owner told the captain to sink it. When a new vessel gets delivered, any new yacht gets delivered, the owner would spend the summer season on board. Now, after a few months, there'll be various things that come up that have problems because you gotta remember every super yacht that's built is bespoke. This one was one of three. This was the third yacht of a series of three yachts, but even so it was different to the other two. So they, they made changes to it. Um, so every boat, even if you take the hull and everything's identical, the interior is different. So that is the normal procedure. That happens with every yacht. It still has that warranty period. But the thing that did happen that probably had something to do with the, the water intake was the fact that they removed that stern door and then they put it back on. And in the, in the uh, report, it says that it was a very difficult job, which means, sounds like it means that there was lots of issues that was, that was basically an untested door at that point. Okay, so question number two from Pale Rider 957. Why would the vessel not have VDR and the modern ballasting software? You spend 40 million on a yacht, you would think that the VDR and software would be standard. Like I said in the video, there was no requirement for this vessel to have a VDR. Uh, only vessels over 3,000 gross tons are required to have a, VCR, a VDR. Now, I, I, I agree that it should have one. I think that every passenger vessel should have one. Even though it's technically classed as a passenger vessel, this is one of the things that comes up quite a lot in my videos when I say there's tw uh, space for 12 guests and people go, oh, it's a 60 meter, 70 meter yacht, why has it only got 12 guests? Well, if, if it has more than 12 guests, it, it actually falls under a different set of rules, which is a commercial passenger vessel. And, it, and it's much more strict on the, the rules of that vessel. And that's why you'll see yachts that have the capacity to carry many more people only carrying 12 people. Now, if it had been in that class, it would have had a VDR. It would have had to have one compulsory, but it didn't. One of the recommendations of the final report was that, that, that all vessels over 500 gross tons should have um, a VDR. As for the software, uh, the stability software, uh, yeah, they didn't have it. Now, I, one of the things I did when I was researching for the video is I contacted a friend of mine who um, who spent um, 10 years at sea. He's a, he's a chief officer and um, he also worked for the New Zealand and Australian um, version of the, uh, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. And um, I asked him about the stability software and this is what his reply was. He said, he said, it's pretty poor that no stability software was provided to assist the master. While any good deck officer should be proficient in calculating stability, the software makes it heaps faster and some would argue dumbs it down admittedly. Next question uh, was from Vera Woods and she said it was poor training. The difference between these are actually not questions. Some of these are not questions. So anyway, I'll, I'll say it's a question. Vera Woods, poor training, the difference between military and civilian. Military is always training and covers it all continually. Uh, plus it should have never been put out to sea. It wasn't ready for civilians. It has to be idiot proof. That, that's a little harsh. Um, she's got a point to, to an extent. I mean, I, I, I was in the military, so I understand what she means. Um, one of the things that dominates your life in the military is training because when the real thing happens you have to do it as naturally as walking down the street so so I understand the training in the military is much much higher um, but there are lots of ex-military uh, in in the yachting I worked on a on a yacht uh, a few years ago and one of the engineers I worked with he was ex New Zealand military uh, Navy when we actually trained, he was he was like the the guy who would oversee it. 
which normally would be the captain or someone, but he, he was so good at it, they, they gave it to him and he made the, the drills very, very realistic, which was great. And that's the way you should do it. And, and some, of, some of the boats I've worked on, the, tr the training has been a little bit lackluster from that point of view. But I think it's unfair to say that the crew are not, that they're not up to the job unless they've been in the military. I, I think that's fair. I've worked with some very professional people who've never been in the military and, and they've been absolutely on their game. So in actual fact, um, let's, let's actually look at some of the information about about the about the um, people on board. So the, the master was 51 years old at the time, held a yacht, a yacht master 3,000 gross tons, which means he can be the captain of any yacht up to 3,000 tons, and all the required STCW titles, and they're basically the um, all the training certificates that we that we have to have, like firefighting, first aid, and all that kind of stuff. And it says he was a pleasure pleasure vessel in commercial use skipper, yacht skipper, yacht master. He had been on board Yogi since the 17th of July, 2011. So he wasn't very experienced with this boat. So the, the first officer was 38 years old. He held a yacht master for 5,000 gross tons and he had the required STCW titles. Originally working as an electrician in the French Navy. So he, so the, you know, he was an electrician, but he's ex-military. He joined his first vessel in 2002 and he had, he had followed up the build since January 2011 and then joined the ship on the 15th of April 2011. So, you know, he was on it from still in the build period uh, right up until the end. So the chief engineer won. He was the relieving chief engineer. This is the guy that was on watch. Uh, so the captain was on the bridge on the watch and this chief engineer was on watch in the engine room when it all kicked off. So he was uh, 50 years old. Held, he actually held a Yacht Master 500 gross tons captain certificate and he held a Chief Engineer Officer for 3000 kilowatts uh, certificate and the required STCW titles. So for an, an engineer, uh, it's more to do with the power of the vessel rather than the tonnage. These, they're all French nationals, by the way. So the Chief Engineer 2, he was the guy who was leaving, 35 years old, he held a Chief Mate 3,000 gross ton certificate. So he was a chief, he was a qualified chief officer for that vessel. And he held a chief engineer 3,000 kilowatts certificate and required STCW uh, titles. Followed up the build for, since October 2010. Then he joined Yogi on the 15th of April, which is when it went to sea. Uh, he was to be paid off on the arrival in France. So that sucks. So there, there were some ex-military in there. There wasn't a lot of experience in there, though, uh, in terms of this vessel. They were all new to the vessel, which is, you know, it's kind of scary. Ordinarily, the, the, the captain and the chief engineer will see the build all the way through, and then they'll go to sea on it. So by the time they go to sea, they know it like the back of the hand already. But in, in this situation, that didn't really happen. The chief engineer, before he joined this vessel, he had, his previous job was on a small vessel, 40 meter, and... Um, and he spent most of the time on that vessel in refit. So he was in refit on that for a long period of time. So he didn't have any sea time. And then he joined this boat and then it was in refit also. So he spent more time in the shipyard. But before that other vessel that he'd spent a year on, he'd actually been a skipper on a vessel before that. So the majority of his sea time leading up to this vessel was as a captain, not as a chief engineer. I would investigate the young man that borrowed the money from the billionaire woman to fund the construction of the super yacht. Somebody had instructed the captain to sabotage the super yacht. Uh, find the young man that borrowed the money. Well, we know who he was. Uh, he's actually the CEO of, um, of Carrefour now. If, you, if, you, if you're from Europe or if you've spent a lot of time in Europe, you'll know of Carrefour. It's a massive supermarket chain that you find in Italy and in France and in all of the European Places most of the European countries that I've been to, there's a car for there, um, and he's the CEO of that. But the backstory for that is, he, like I said in the video, he borrowed um, 143 million euros from Lillian Betancourt. The problem is that she had Alzheimer's and she'd been doing some crazy stuff, like she was giving like monies to the electrician and stuff like that. So she was clearly not in a position to be able to make that kind of loan. And there were actually 10 people in, in France around. When they, when they discovered that this had happened, they, they found 10 people, including the president of France, 
uh, Nicholas Sarkozy was one of the people. And they basically all got taken to court. Eight of them went to prison. And I assume that Stefan and, uh, and Nicholas Sarkozy were the two that didn't. And they all got, well, they all had to pay it back. And, and obviously um, that's what a lot of the people thinking that he had it scuttled think that that's the reason why he did it. So that, but that didn't happen until later. The daughter actually took them to court. In May 2015, Stefan Corby was fined 250,000 euros for securing 143 million euros in investments into his business from the widow. I had to get my, my lady to do some of the research because obviously this guy's French and a lot of this was in French. So, um, and she speaks French, she speaks English, Spanish and French. So she, she um, translated a lot of this for me, which was, which was great because I don't speak French at all. The story was the entrepreneur Stéphane Corby gives 143.7 million euros to the family of Lilian Betancourt. Stéphane Corby indicted for swindle and concealment of abuse of weakness in the Betancourt case. So apparently he paid it all back in one go. So I wonder where he got that money from. So this is from Super Yacht Captain. He's not just a guy who's got an avatar called Super Yacht Captain. He's actually the captain of a Super Yacht. Strange as that may sound. Uh, and, and he's a YouTuber. So um, check out his channel. Uh, I'll put a link below. Uh, he's got the best gig because he, is, he works on a charter yacht. And he gets to film on the charter yacht. I mean, I would love to be in that situation where I can just film every day. Um, I'd love to be able to show you around the yacht I work on. There's some fantastic things about that yacht, which I'd love to be able to do. Unfortunately... I can't do that. Anyway, his question. As mentioned in the video, there was some speculation over an insurance scam. Did the owner buy another vessel after the loss of Yogi? That's a very good question. I spent a lot of time looking into this. Someone, someone's probably going to put in the comments, yeah, this is his boat. But I couldn't find any evidence that he, he bought another yacht after this. I, I doubt he'd want to, guilty or innocent, of, of, of deliberately sinking this vessel. I, I don't think... Either way, I don't think he'd want to have another yacht. But yeah, I did do quite a lot of research looking for the evidence that he had another yacht, but I couldn't find anything. Okay, so next question is Bluey9. Why would you want to leave port so quickly and go into such a storm when you knew the boat had a history of problems? Very convenient that there was a storm coming to hide all evidence and blame everything on the boat manufacturer when she went down for shore. The thing about going to sea is, if you know for sure that there is weather out there that is too much for your vessel, because you'll, you'll know based on the stability of your vessel that uh, it's too much. And if, there is, if there's weather out there that you cannot avoid, then most captains, or every captain should, but every captain I've ever worked for will say, we're not going to sea today because the weather's too rough. We have to wait for it to calm down. Or like happened to me not that long ago, we went to sea, but we went right around, we were in the Med, we, we, were, leaving, um, we were leaving Italy, and instead of going right across down to Gibraltar, we went all the way around past Sardinia, we kept to the Italian coast, and then we went round the bottom to, uh, to miss the weather. It was still rough, but we were able to keep in weather that was, was not too much for the vessel. Now, it's possible that he thought he could do that, but the weather forecast that he stated, that, that, um, that he put in the, in the report, and again, this was just based on his recollections because they didn't save any of the logs. The ship's log, the engineering log, those, those two things should have been recovered by the crew, but they didn't. And that's why uh, if they had a VDR on board, then providing they found that capsule uh, afterwards, then that would have answered all these questions. But the report that he stated was um, two meter waves and five to six knot uh, winds with 35 knot gusts. So that's not too much for that boat. There was a, some questions that I saw, which I don't have in front of me, was about the speed of the boat. So what happened is in the report, the Beamer report, they said that the boat was doing 14 knots, which is what the captain said he was doing. And the time they said that he left, the Dardanelles Straits was 1830 hours. In another instance, and I don't have the information, I couldn't find the information, but the, the owner of the shipyard said that he told, I don't know whether he told them or he told somebody else, but he told somebody, the captain had told somebody, that they left the Dardanelles Straits at 1930 hours. 
Okay, guys, so there's, I made a mistake in, the, in this, what I was saying right there. So the, the, the discrepancy that I mentioned was that the, um, uh, the Beamer report said that they left the Dardanelles Straits at 18.30 hours UTC plus 2. So that's the time zone, right? So, uh, but when the uh, captain, the captain was working in a different time zone. So the shipyard believes the captain was working in UTC plus 1. So when he said it was 1830, it was actually 1930. So when they worked out the speed of the vessel, they used the, cor they used the incorrect um, time. So they actually added an hour to it, which made the speed seem slower. And that's why we normally use UTC wherever we are in the world. And that way you don't have this kind of discrepancy. If they were pushing the vessel that hard in that weather, because the, the weather forecast from the Greek uh, search and rescue said that it had seven and a half meter waves which is pretty bad a lot of people commented on the when the video the video of search and rescue rescuing the people out of the water said, oh it doesn't look that bad but I, i'll tell you something whenever i i'm on a ship and the weather's rough and then i record it on camera it never looks as bad as it does as when you're actually standing there um, I don't know why that is, it's just, it's a bit weird, but that weather looked pretty gnarly to me. Uh, and also, remember that they called for um, a mayday at 4.30 in the morning, and that helicopter didn't arrive until 7.30, because the first helicopter that got scrambled had a problem and they couldn't take off, so they had to get another one. There was a delay, that's why there was a bit of a delay. But by the time they were getting airlifted off, it was like nearly 8 o'clock in the morning, so the weather could have calmed down by that point. So it could have been much worse than what we saw in the in the video of them getting rescued. Okay, next question. Tom Robinson, uh, was the design of the exhaust a significant problem? Actually, the underwater exhaust is quite common. It's not, like I had somebody comment uh, in the f after the first video that I suggested that uh, it was unusual. I, I just told you that it had an underwater exhaust. The exhaust is actually uh, quite common. I did a video about the new Aviva, and they've got this 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 angled thing where because they have the exhaust coming out the funnel, and they have this angle thing there. And I explained that that's so when they when they're at sea, the wind will automatically be blown up and it will push the smoke away. That doesn't work when you're at anchor, and so the smoke can just drift down. So if you have an underwater exhaust or a wet exhaust. Um, it, it doesn't it, it solves that problem so they are very popular so they're not unusual at all uh, the problem with this one is they didn't have an alarm after the 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 water injection so they they, they blast water into the exhaust as well and and then it goes through a scrubber as well which is a kind of filter and one of the pro the first problem is that the there was no alarm um, so the engineers didn't know until they physically went inside and probably saw smoke billowing out of this uh, expansion um, slot, uh, expansion sleeve that had failed. Dodgy lad, doggy lad, sorry. <laughs> Would the captain need to declare to his new employer he lost the vessel at sea in such a controversial way, would the captain be at risk of losing licenses? None of them have found to have done anything wrong and none of them lost their licenses. And within a year, they were all working on other vessels. Now, I did some research, uh, or actually I did some research and my, my, my lady did some research as well. And we think we found the captain, I'm not gonna mention his name. His name's out there, by the way. Uh, so is the chief engineer's name. The, we've got their names. We found somebody um, on LinkedIn who had the same name, who was a captain of yachts. Um, I can't confirm if it's the same person. However, in his, in his uh, employment history, he doesn't mention, strangely, Yogi. Now, it's, it, I'm saying it, it might not be him. It could be somebody else. When you, um, when you work at sea, you have something, you have something like this which is a, a seaman's discharge book, which sounds quite funny, doesn't it? Seaman and discharge. Um, but it's a seaman's, not seaman's, seaman's discharge book. And every time you, every time you go to sea, they, they stamp it. So this is when I was on cruise ships. So they, they put the, the name of the ship, when you joined, when you left, uh, what you did, your capacity, uh, 
where the ship went and it's signed by the captain and it's stamped by the by the ship so he he will have one of those so now obviously he it's not hard to lose one of those right so he could have lost it and then got a new one and that takes care of that business but I think word would get around. Uh, put, uh, Robert Rutherford, with all of the alleged electronic devices not working, could the transom door have been left open? Warning light alarm not working, this whole thing stinks. Um, there was a couple of things not working that we know of. Um, the, the thing is, when, you, when you're closing one of those doors, it's, 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 um, obviously it's so important that there are lots of um, things built in so it doesn't open itself. Or you, can't, you could sail with it open, like the Herald of Free Enterprise, that ferry sank because the guy who was in charge of closing the doors fell asleep on his bunk and there was a breakdown of communication. The captain on the bridge didn't call on the radio and ask him, did you close the doors? So it's possible, theoretically, that they sailed and left it open. And they had a pilot on board as well. So the pilot would have noticed something like that. Because when the pilot disembarked, they would have had a boat come up to meet them. So if the transom door was open and you were leaking water, you should get bilge alarms. So you should have alarms activating because there's water ingress, right? So they fill up. Uh, even my dehumidifier here has got one of those alarms. It turns itself off automatically if it gets full up. So, but they didn't activate. That's another failure. Now, was that a failure of the shipyard, the way they constructed it? Or was it just because of the changes they made in that area, in the stern underneath the beach club. We'll, we'll never know. Another problem, which I didn't actually mention in the video because, because of time restraint, really, was that the side doors, they had two shell doors. So, so in the stern of the ship, they had two shell doors. So his bows here, they have two, two shell doors and the transom door. So the transom door is a stern door and they had two shell doors and they open out like this as well. So you have this beach club type thing if you want. And you can also have boats where you, you have winches and you drop them in the water. Now, the, the bottoms of those doors were under the water line. So the water line was coming up to here and the door was open and outwards like this. So when the door was open, it was actually in the water the whole time. But when they closed it, it was under the water line. But if the, if the door's under the waterline and the seal fails on the door, then it's coming in regardless. It could be possible when they built that, because remember they, they added extra weight to the top. And then they had, to, they had to add 27, I think it was 27 metric tons of ballast. They had to weld it to the keel. So that would have lowered the boat in the water. So that, that when they designed that boat, the door was probably above. It was probably as a result of that extra weight that was added. So, um, but I've got some video footage I'll show you from a, a yacht I worked on a long time ago. What happens when you close the door? So you, when the door's closing, you have, this, you have this system, you turn the power on, you press the button, it starts beeping. And then the, the door closes very slowly. And when it gets us to the top, you've got these big dogged clamps that come out and they close into, and there's usually like eight or 10 of them all around, and they, and they park themselves into the hole. Now, if for any reason they don't close properly, you'll get this audible alarm. It's impossible to miss it. And, the, and also on the, on the panel where you press the buttons, that they illuminate. So when the door's open, it's red. And when the door closes, it's green, and that tells you it's closed. There will be an audible alarm. A lot of people were asking what my opinion was. So many comments. I think the, I think the two videos have had over, over 3,000 comments. And I would say that probably 60% of the comments is insurance fraud. Um, and it was sank deliberately. I, I don't think it's insurance fraud. It's always a culmination of lots of little mistakes that leads to these things. Now, the conspiracy theorists among us might say, yeah, that was definitely done on purpose. But more often than not, a lot, one of these things on its own wouldn't make any difference. But because in this situation, they just all added up and became the perfect storm. Uh, I can't imagine being on a vessel in that kind of weather and said, oh, I'm going to sink the boat. I, I have no guarantee I'm going to get out of it with my life. So, you know, $2 million, that's a number I just pulled out of the air, by the way. $2 million is no good if you're dead, right? I don't think they did it on purpose. I think that 
there was a combination of deficiencies of the vessel, deficiencies with that stern door most likely, the shell doors were underwater, combination of the fact that the crew were new to that vessel. The chief engineer hadn't spent an awful lot of time as a chief engineer in the previous few years. However, there was two chief engineers on board and the outgoing chief engineer, he should have really taken the lead, but it doesn't appear like that he did. I hope you found this uh, informative. I hope this has answered some of the questions that you might have had at the end of the second video. Let's talk about it in the comments. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe. If you're a new subscriber, by the way, great to have you. I'm really happy that I've had so many new subscribers uh, recently. Um, and yeah, welcome aboard. And um, I hope to be talking to you in the comments soon. So, all right, guys. All right, guys, take it easy. Bye-bye for now.